I told you that everything about the way we treat autism is fundamentally wrong? One of the most common therapies we use to treat autism is based in years of bad science. When the first of these treatments was created nearly 60 years ago, it left consequences that still hurt people on the spectrum today. When I was growing up, the Andrew Wakefield study falsely linking the MMR vaccine to autism was very fresh in people's minds. The neurodiversity movement was only a couple years old. It seemed that just as autistic people were deciding that they liked who they were and were okay with the label they identified with, other people were hard at work to change that. When I was around seven years old, I was diagnosed with sensory processing disorder, or SPD. I hated being touched, I hated loud and sudden noises, and I had a knack for hearing everything within a quarter mile radius. I really struggled with social rules and constructs. I was also hyperlexic, which is a really fancy way of saying that while most kids my age were reading books with only a handful of words per page, I was reading Harry Potter. <laughs> Getting me to do anything that was not reading or art was like pulling teeth. The sky could be falling, but I would ignore it in the interest of more time with my books and my, books and my paper and markers. If you dared to take them away from me, intrude upon my space, or make an unsavory noise, I would become a small child version of the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> I realize I am speaking of my symptoms in the past tense. However, that, definitely, that does not mean that I don't still struggle with them today. I still find people really confusing. I still really hate loud and sudden noises. I'm just... I also am definitely still am quick to anger, as I once was. I'm just a lot better at hiding it now. That's my secret. I'm always angry. <laughs> While many of these are characteristic traits of autism, I was never given a separate diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, which I will refer to as ASD henceforth. It was to my understanding that sensory processing disorder was under the, A the ASD umbrella at my time of diagnosis, so an additional diagnosis would be redundant. I also feel that my symptoms better align themselves with ASD versus sensory processing disorder, which is why I refer to myself as autistic. Then the IEPs, the CVT, the ADA, and IDEA, and all the other alphabet soup that comes with. My mother, bless her heart so much, had to cart me to a therapist once a week, make sure that my teachers were following my individualized education plan, that's an IEP, scour the internet for clothes that would not cause me to melt down, keep fidgets in literally every nook and cranny, and keep an eye on a series of very incompetent principals and superintendents. I would often come home from school and tell her about what happened that day, and I'd say something to the effect of, oh, Mr. So-and-so did X, Y, and Z, to which she would quickly reply, they did what? <laughs> I like to think that if I had a dollar for every time one of those people broke a clause of the ADA or IDEA, I would be very well off. My mom was also there at virtually all of my therapy appointments. Behavioral therapy, for all you uninitiated out there, is when a woman in her 50s sits in a very overstuffed chair and tells you how to make yourself as normal as possible. <laughs> Sometimes she has BTs, or behavioral techs, which are 20-somethings fresh from their undergrad degrees who make art with you or play board games with you while the older woman watches. <laughs> she takes notes on what I do. Do you use words like please or thank you? Did you inappropriately display anger? Did you use any self-regulatory behaviors? This is also known as stimming, which that is any behavior that helps an individual self-regulate or process information. That is how I like to stim. I rub a satin ribbon in between my fingers and that really helps me focus. I recognize the importance of what I was taught and all the sacrifices that went into it. However, at the heart of most behavioral therapy, is the idea that neurodivergence, or neurological traits that, dis that differ from the perceived norm, are wrong and need to be corrected. When I needed processing time or had a meltdown, I was often scolded. If I was able to effectively and verbally communicate my needs, I was praised. This is called masking. 
hiding neurodiverse traits in the interest of appearing more normal. And this is what many autistic and neurodivergent people are taught in the place of proper coping mechanisms. I realize I only got a much milder version of behavioral therapy, so not true ABA, but I certainly felt the negative effects that can be associated with it. When I was around 11 years old, I fell into a very deep depression. I didn't understand why I was so different or why I had to hide that. On top of the bullying and exclusion I faced at school, I also had virtually nowhere to go with my bottled up emotions. So I tried talking to other people. I would show them my words, words I had spent hours drawing and composing and working on, but all they would do was look at it and say, that's beautiful. They say that when words fail, art speaks. I was only asking for help, but got very discouraged when I realized other people did not speak my language. When my family stopped encouraging me to be someone I'm not, my mental health seriously improved. I slowly but surely learned how to take off the mask, but what I found really bothered me. While I had had it on for all that many years continuously, I was losing out in who I was. I forgot who I was as a person. And that made me think, there must surely be a better way of doing this. And while there, was, there is, why is it so much less common than standard behavioral therapy? The answer to that is buried in quite a bit of history. In the 1960s, a man named Ole Ivailo Vas saw great promise in B.S. Skinner's work on pigeons and rats to be adopted to humans. B.F. Skinner did studies where he would give the animals rewards if he pressed a bar. This is a concept known as operant conditioning. The subject is given a reward if they perform the correct choice or given a punishment if they choose the incorrect choice. Lovas created this into a treatment known as applied behavioral analysis, or ABA, and he hoped it would be able to make children, quote, indistinguishable from their peers. The first child to be referred to Lovas's clinic was a young girl named Beth, who had very severe self-injurious behaviors. When Beth would become agitated, she would bang her head on hard surfaces, such as tables or filing cabinets. Lovas attempted to teach her behaviors, such as hugging when it was requested or responding to music with dancing. Initially, Lovas and his team ignored Beth's self-injurious behaviors as they thought acknowledging it would cause it to be reinforced. When that didn't work, they tried consoling her using phrases such as, I do not think you are bad. That didn't work either. And one day, Lovas got so frustrated with Beth that he, in his own words, quote, cracked her one on the rear. Beth ceased all her headbanging behaviors after that. The next set of children to be referred to Lovas' clinic was a pair of twins, two boys named Mike and Marty. Mike and Marty had, quote, a fair amount of tantrum behaviors, such as screaming, throwing objects, and hitting themselves. Lovas tried loud sounds, sounds over 100 decibels, but when that didn't work, he implemented and activated an electric floor when the twins took more than three seconds to initiate a hug with a lab assistant. They also weren't allowed any food or drink, except for the token scraps that they earned for performing desirable behaviors. After some time, Mike and Marty quickly and outwardly displayed affection. There was very much media coverage for Lovas's work with the twins. People praised him for his effectiveness with his work. However, it was not without criticism. Even B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning, and the muse of ABA spoke out against this treatment. Parents weren't exactly sold on the idea of harming their children into being normal either. Lovas responded to this criticism by accusing the parents of not loving their children and presenting his therapy as the only way that their, ch their children could lead normal lives. Despite methods like TEACH, which originated around the same time and were much friendlier, 
Teach did not get quite the same amount of press as ABA and therefore was not nearly as common. You may have also noticed the recent outcry against gay conversion therapy. Gay kids are being abused into no longer experiencing sexual attra attraction and they are protesting their treatment. People are calling for gay conversion therapy to be banned, especially for minors. Now, you may be asking, what does this have to do with autism and ABA? And the answer to that is actually quite a bit. Not only was ABA and gay conversion therapy created by exactly the same person, it uses virtually the same techniques. We all know it's not okay to force a child to be someone they're not and have, their have the love and support of others around them be based on their ability to be someone they're not. So I ask you this, why is it okay when the child is autistic, but for any other child, it's considered inhumane? When are we going to start holding the same standards for children in ABA? <sighs> to this day, we still use the same techniques on autistic children as we would with rats, and rats with wings. <laughs> Shock devices, although they are not nearly as common, are still used in some places, such as the Judge Rottenberg Center, despite the FDA condemning their use. Scientists have also noticed an epidemic of emotional health problems within the autistic community. A, 28, a 2015 study in Sweden identified that adults with autism are 10 times more likely to commit suicide compared to the general population. An additional study in 2018 identified masking as a major risk factor for suicidal ideation in autistic adults. Masking is, again, hiding neurodivergent traits in the interest of appearing more normal. And unfortunately, masking is something that ABA very much encourages. So, what can we do about it? My goal is not to chide those of you who work in behavioral therapy or call you all bad people. Nor is it my goal to call the parents who put their kids through treatment bad people. It is critical that we address the problem of some therapists misusing their position and note ABA's very high abuse potential, but that is certainly not everyone. Finger pointing does us no good. My goal is to start a conversation between autistic and neurodivergent people, their families, and their providers. Because when we all talk and we all listen, that's when real progress happens. If you're a mental health professional or plan to become one, please do not assume you won't encounter people on the autism spectrum in an ordinary clinical setting. To pro if we are to properly address the issue of the emotional health crisis in the autistic community, we need providers who are able to spot the overlaps in autism and some mental illnesses. Even those of us who are fully verbal can still struggle to explain our feelings. With a, and without a lack of diagnostic tools catered specifically towards people with autism, we definitely need mental health care providers who are able to spot these subtleties. If you are a parent, a family member, or a friend, of somebody on the autism spectrum or an otherwise neurodivergent person. Please do not equate masking with progress. Congratulating us on our ability to pretend to be someone we're not is harmful to our emotional health and can be even more harmful when it comes from a loved one. When my parents noticed how unhappy I was with pretending to be someone I'm not and instead noticed and congratulated me on my ability to deal with my emotions and my symptoms in a healthy way, I became a much happier person. True, healthy progress is going to look different for everybody and will happen at different speeds. Some days we can do more than others, but what we need to know is that what we can do, no matter how small or insignificant it may seem, is valuable and important, and we need to hear that from you. If you work with autistic people or plan to, please take great care with the methods you use. Let's imagine you are in a strange alternate universe where neurodivergence is the norm. Would you tolerate being forced into behaviors that are painful for you? 
Would you tolerate being told that the proper way to express happiness is to spin in circles, but then be punished when you smiled or laughed instead? I don't think so. Do your best to find things to help your client that don't hurt themselves or others or require them to let go of who they are. Hand flapping hurts nobody, nor do most interests. If your client loves video games or dinosaurs or what have you, please do not put them off to it. These can serve as important methods of communication, and communication should be considered valuable no matter what form it comes in. So please do not be so quick to change us, especially if who we are hurts nobody. In the wise words of Temple Grandin, the world needs all kinds of minds. If we fail to support an entire group of people simply because we feel they are too different, then we fail to support ourselves. We fail society because the gifts that they could contribute are lost. If we do not all succeed, we do not succeed at all. Thank you.